Thank you, Roger, for uh, this kind introduction. Thanks, everyone, for showing up uh, this early. Uh, don't worry, it will be the last talk, uh, so you won't have to suffer last through talk this. By you. By, by me, yeah, yeah, yeah. By me. by me, of course. I want to thank, of course, um, the organizers for inviting me to what is my first Evolang ever, first of uh, many, I hope. Um, it's particularly gratifying to see uh, so many people coming from different fields. I wish all our theoretical linguistics conferences were of this kind. Um, and so I will try to give you, um, each and every one of you something um, in this presentation. I'll be particularly critical of the kind of theoretical linguistics that I have done so far. Okay? And um, I've, I'll try to... Um, reach a consensus view that may surprise some of you or please um, others of you. I'll start with uh, someone that makes uh, a few of you at least uncomfortable. I apologize. Uh, uh, this is uh, Noam Chomsky. I'll start with giving you a bit of background uh, for what's coming up in this talk. I'll give you sort of a few sources of influence uh, for what's coming up and Chomsky is uh, certainly oh, one of the uh, main sources that I will draw from, not the only one by any means. Um, the second person that I'll rely on um, is uh, Dick Lewontin. The third person is Mark Hauser. And the fourth one, perhaps some of you can't recognize him, it's David Puppel. Um, I'll rely on them in this particular order. I had the uh, great fortune to interact with all of them for many years and learn from them and what you'll get today is basically what I've uh, tried to gather from uh, these interactions. From Chomsky I'll borrow the idea that certain aspects of the thing that we call language in everyday conversation can be studied in a scientific manner as part of the subject matter of biology so I see it's not that scary I'm not going to assume more than this. And um, if we do so, according to Chomsky, uh, then uh, we could try to understand or at least shed some light on what makes us uh, human ultimately. Okay? Uh, once you take this stance that some have called the um, biological or biolinguistic stance, then a lot of things uh, begin uh, to make sense in the context of language, especially in the context of language acquisition. This was the uh, main message of uh, the work of er Eric Lenneberg. But it's fair to say, and here I agree with uh, Ray Jackendorf, that as the um, particular stance that Chomsky took uh, developed, um, we have often uh, gotten lost in our, you know, th uh, theoretical uh, discussions and have lost track of the biological uh, commitment uh, that was at the very beginning and center of the enterprise. It's been sort of displaced uh, to the periphery. And I think that uh, in large part, uh, the, uh, the followers of uh, Chomsky's program are to blame for this. Okay, and what I would like to try to do is sort of remedy that situation a little bit um, in, in ways that you will see. Okay, so I think that it's fair to say that today theoretical linguistics um, with this biological commitment has, uh, has sort of regressed and it would be nice to, to do something about it. Okay? Uh, this is a quote from uh, Salvador Luria in 1976 in a AAAS address where he actually discussed the uh, field of biolinguistics and ends his uh, discussion saying, this is a field for the future. In a couple of years, we'll see really great progress. Uh, this wasn't quite right on target, I think. Um, in particular, Luria predicted in 76 that within a couple of years, we would have linguists and uh, biologists uh, talking to one another. And uh, we spe specifically, we would have linguists looking at biological data and, and trying to just make interesting hypotheses about uh, the data. That hasn't happened. I mean, if you um, think, for example, of the uh, FOXP2 discovery, it's been fantastic. 
um, I think, but it's not been so great uh, for the theoretical linguists. They haven't had much to say once they've gotten confronted with data that's particularly interesting and should be relevant. Okay? Nonetheless, I think that uh, things could um, change um, for a variety of reasons. Once uh, we are getting, and we will get um, in the future, better and better data coming from the biologists, and this is a source of data that we cannot afford uh, to ignore or remain uh, silent on. We also have, I think, a better theoretical stance. Now, if I say minimalism, I'll try not to mention the terms uh, too many times. Um, don't think that I'm buying into a particular theoretical uh, package. I just mean that many linguists of a Chomskyan persuasion have come to realize that um, their theory of universal grammar is so baroque as to be implausible, and this is all I mean by minim minimalism. So they've tried to actually do what um, other traditions in, in linguistics had done before, namely minimize uh, that component to just make it somewhat more plausible. In addition, I think that we are gradually moving away from Broca, Wernicke, and that's it for language and the brain. I think we have um, moved way beyond the classical model, and this would be particularly useful because we may then try to make more informed hypotheses about um, how language is implemented in the brain. And last but not least, we've also, well, some haven't really, but um, some are moving beyond uh, the modern synthesis in um, biology, moving beyond a narrow set of hypotheses uh, um, with respect to evolution in general. And as the theory of biology expands, we have more room to find our place in it. Okay? So for all these things, I think that it's worth reconsidering the biological stance of theoretical linguistics. Bearing in, in mind, of course, that what we will find is likely to be messy and complex in a way that uh, Dick Lewontin has uh, told us many, many times. You just read the triple helix and you realize that uh, the story is not going to be maybe interesting, but it's not going to be clean. This is the uh, extended synthesis uh, model that's, um, you know, of a particularly interesting um, sort uh, for us. I think that we have moved beyond uh, neo-Darwinism to entertain a set of hypotheses. If this works, and this doesn't seem to. But anyway, um, we have um, basically entertaining an expanded range of concepts to deal with uh, the origin of certain traits, and I think that um, linguists will benefit from just having more hypotheses to draw from. We can finally forget some um, caricatures and rely more on what uh, Gould had told us, uh, especially what Gould had told um, Dan Dennett that you see on the picture. Dan Dennett didn't listen particularly well on that day. Um, the third source of influence uh, that I will draw from is Mark Hauser and the sort of approach that uh, mm, you know other people following Mark has done. Mm, here you have on your left the famous or infamous, depending on where you come from, FLN FLB distinction. Um, the talk I gave on Monday urged theoretical linguists to forget that particular distinction. I don't think it's um, well-grounded, biologically speaking, but it was a first try that was influential, if only because Chomsky seemed to have endorsed it at one point. And um, it was specifically useful, at least as far as I'm concerned, in drawing attention to the richness of FLB. So I don't want you to ask me too many questions about what's specific in FLN. I know this is what gets theoretical linguists excited. I think this is the wrong source of excitement. The source of excitement really is FLB. Okay? Um, 
Here I have a quote from Tecumseh Fitch in, uh, from a 2011 paper, and I'll read uh, bits and pieces of it to make you realize that the Fitch of the Hauser, Chomsky, and Fitch paper has finally come to realize that from a biological point of view, this sharp distinction FLN, FLB um, is not, at least from a biological viewpoint, is not particularly good. Okay, uh, Fitch, for example, has written that from a biological viewpoint, this distinction between what's specifically linguistic and what's more generally cognitive, a cognitive is unproductive and misleading. I think he was uh, quite right about this, even though mm, following the 2002 paper, it seems like everyone was trying to draw a very sharp distinction between the two. And uh, if you ask the biologists, they will tell you this is no good way to do biology, okay? Um, today, I will not have much to say about what FLN is if we abandon the FLN-FLB distinction. This is the topic of innovation in biology, specifically related to language in this context, and it relates to Ivo Devo in a way that I've talked on Monday, and uh, so I won't say anything about this today. What I will focus on, of course, is how we could, as theoretical linguists, make informed and informative hypotheses about evolution, okay? And here you have my friend Gary Marcus waving his hands, um, repeating and repeating that if you want to move from here to there, you have to be careful because genes build neural structures. Well, even that's not true, but anyway. <coughs> genes build, certainly they don't build behavior. I mean, there are a couple of steps in between, say, cognition and evolution that uh, cannot be ignored if you want to make interesting hypotheses. And what I will try to do today is precisely following that advice. That is, I'll first um, give you a couple of theoretical notions and try to map them onto the brain as we know it. And from there on, ask questions about the evolution of those brain structures and then see if we can relate those three uh, domains, okay? And in order to do this, I'll take inspiration from um, a research program that David Popple has been advocating. I don't think that it has received the attention it deserves. Um, what Popple is basically saying, this is a, an abstract of a recent paper uh, really clearly summarizing what he's after. What David Popple is urging us is that both evolutionary and genetic approaches to studying the biological foundations of speech and language could benefit from fractionating the problem at a finer grain. And the point shouldn't be to aim um, at mapping genetics to language or mapping genetics to phonology or syntax or semantics or whichever field you prefer, but rather to link genetic results to component formal operations that underlie what we've called syntax, phonology, semantics, and so on. And Popple in particular stresses the fact that these operations are likely to be generic, not specific to language. Um, they are what he calls generic subroutines, and they'll try to make hypotheses in this direction. So the theoretical linguists among you may ask me in the question period, but this is not quite, you know, linguistic. I mean, this is certainly not the kind of specificity that we love to see in uh, the generative literature, for example. And my answer will be yes, that's not that. Okay. All right, let's skip a few more things. And um, so, a warning, uh, what follows is not going to be the um, orthodox kind of theoretical linguistics uh, with which I may be associated, but it will also be the a kind of orthodox biology that many uh, people tend to assume. But I don't know of any easy way. Okay, that is, we'll have to both uh, um, make victims uh, on the biology side and also on the linguistic side. Okay. Um, and part of the motivation, the final motivation that I'll follow, are certain remarks uh, by Chomsky and this is not perhaps the uh, best quote, this one is more famous or well known, um, that goes way back to 1965 and 1976, where Chomsky talked about principles of neural organizations that may be even more deeply grounded in physical law, or he asks about whether we know, in fact he's skeptical about mm, you know, that, whether we know 
what happens when, you know, as many neurons as we have are crammed into something the size of a basketball? What happens in this particular case? And I'll address this particular issue because I think that since 1976, we have come to learn more about what could happen in this case. All right. So to make this work, we'll need a, the most minimal specification uh, for universal grammar. I know many of you don't like the term, but <coughs> substitute it with your favorite term if you don't like it. But some minimal specification that would allow us to actually make interesting hypotheses about language, have a matching hypothesis about the brain, and then ask about its develop, uh, development and, and evolution. Okay. The easy part for the linguist, the one that I'll go over very, very quickly, that is I want you to buy what I'm giving you, and if you don't want to buy it now, you can buy my forthcoming book that's even nicer, um, is uh, the following. I think that the minimal specification that we'll need, the non-negotiable non -negotiable part, if you want, of um, specification for universal grammar we'll need is just this. Three properties... Uh, don't be thrown off by the jargon. Three properties that I think will be particularly useful in trying to relate a brain, mind, and evolution. One is, uh, these are standard names. The, one, the first one is called the edge property. The second one is called merge. Uh, the third one is called uh, the cycle. I'll explain briefly what I mean uh, by these. By the edge property, I mean a very, very boring Thing. I think it's actually a bad term, this edge property. But the boring thing I mean by this is that somehow um, with language, with the system we call language, we have access to atoms of computations. You can call them words. I prefer lexical items. It doesn't matter. But these lexical items have at least one property, the property of being able to combine with other lexical items. That's what I mean by edge property. Okay? That is... Um, they might have certain restrictions, but there is certainly one um, computational potential they have, and it's the ability to combine. That's what I mean. Okay? I don't want you to think of words or lexical items as little trees with a lot of specifications that's good for theoretical linguistics, that's not so good for biolinguistics. What I want you to think of when I say edge property, I mean a property that essentially starts with certain concepts that we share, for example, with other animals, but remove some of their, if you want, selectional restrictions, some of their valencies, as it were. What the edge property does for language is that it takes certain concepts from coming from various modules or dom domains of the minds and makes them all available in one giant workspace, as it were, that we call language and specifically the lexicon. That's what I mean by edge property, and we'll have to ask how this uh, came to be. Um, by merge, I just mean the boring combination of, uh, of lexical items, so I just mean something like set formation. Um, you shouldn't expect me to say that merge was the magic bullet. Uh, certainly, it was available in other species. Okay. And then uh, the third component that I need will be what many people have called cycle or cyclic transfer or even phases and aspects of the literature. By this, I mean that after, a certain, uh, after certain steps of combinations, the output, the temporary output of this computation in syntax is um, given for evaluation in other components of the minds. That's all I mean. Okay? Um, but one thing, though, that's very important to realize is that if you buy both a set formation operation that applies iteratively and a so, sort of cyclic transfer approach, uh, you get basically two modes of recursions immediately in language. And I think this, in part, led to the confusion of, well, do we have recursion or not? In fact, we have different kinds in language. One is um, what I've called direct or dense uh, recursive pattern. That is, you combine, you combine, you combine without stopping. And a more indirect or sparse recursive system that transfers certain portions at different times, but not continually. Okay. So you get two periods or two kinds of rhythms in, uh, in syntax. Okay? In addition to this, um, what you need 
to make informative um, hypotheses about language with just these three things that I've given you, you need to appeal to a rich cognitive structure or conceptual substance to, you know, get our semantics, basically. Here you have three fantastic books. My favorite is uh, more on the left, but the three of them are um, perfectly uh, fine titles. Um, showing that uh, this rich cognitive structure is certainly there. I mean, if this, um, I must buy. Um, if you don't like the three books I've shown you, you can take a look at others. I think it's indisputable that other animals really gave us a lot of what we regard as natural language semantics. Okay? This, of course, uh, has to be qualified somewhat in that as soon as you buy a rich conceptual structure and the three syntactic uh, properties that I've given you, it m may mean, of course, that the way we think, the way we manipulate those concepts that we share with other species may end up having a slightly different kind of representation. This is a hypothesis that I share with people like Paul Petrosky and Wolfram Hinzen, for example, that are on this slide, or Juan Oria Gareca. But basically, when I say semantic thing, that sh shared is the, is the name of the game here. On the other side of the grammar, the externalization side, here we are even luckier, or as lucky as in the semantic side, we share a lot with other species, perhaps not our closest relatives, but certainly with other vocal learners. It's actually... Uh, remarkable that the properties that we are beginning to discover in the context of bird songs map in terms of the Chomsky hierarchy map exactly on the same point where phonological systems of natural languages map, namely the finite states and not beyond this. Okay, so here you have a couple of um, uh, here you have the Heinz and Itzardi paper uh, recently published in Science showing that the kind of complexity we find in phonology not same as in syntax, is of the same kind that people like uh, Kazo Kanoya or Bob Berwick and others have shown is valid for birdsong. So that too is shared. That's something that uh, we don't need um, extra properties from, uh, at least for natural languages, but it's of course something that we recruit uh, for language. Okay? And then you're saying, that's it? And I say no. And this is a slide that will hopefully please many of you, and I'll say it explicitly in order for you to get from what I've given you so far to natural languages, you need to assume that in between there's going to be a lot of culture-based grammar formation, grammaticalization and these sorts of operations that are crucial in order for me to get from the minimal specification I've given you that just gives you a rough scaffolding of syntax to the rich grammatical substance of um, modern-day uh, languages. Um, you guys are expert on this. Um, all I'm doing here is say that I'll have to buy a lot of the things that you have on sale because otherwise I won't be able to get from the underspecified UG that I've given you with these three properties to uh, natural languages. So not only do you have a role to play, uh, the approaches, in fact, need to complement uh, one another. If you want, the minimal specifications I've given you are like the weak biases that, among many others, that we have cognitively will give you rise to uh, culture-based grammar formation. Okay? Um, specifically, the culture-based grammar formation will be important in what we call the interface between syntax and phonology, what's called morphology. This is where things will get complex and, and um, messy. Okay? All right. Um, so, so far, what I've given you is a picture that, at least for semantics or for phonology, both of sound and sign, for externalization, um, can draw on uh, rich animal models. Maybe not as rich as we would like right now, but in a couple of years we'll le learn more. The puzzle will be for the three properties that I've given you at the beginning, where are those coming from? Okay, and that will be my focus. It doesn't mean that that's the only interesting thing. Please don't say, is that FLN? Okay, don't ask that. But it means that this will be a particular puzzle that we would like to, to discuss. Okay? 
And in order for me to discuss the evolution of these properties, I'll have to say, first of all, how we could relate them to, uh, to the brain. Okay? And here I have a hypothesis that I think new, although it draws on components that are available in the literature. And the first component that I'll draw from is a hypothesis by Stan Hand, Changeux, and others that unfortunately, I say unfortunately because you know, in the literature it's known as a hypothesis for consciousness and how consciousness is realized in the brain. I think that uh, consciousness is a word that I'll try to avoid. Okay? Uh, for just good science form. Okay? But what the hand and changeur has claimed is that our brain basically gives has the ability to construct what they have called a global workspace of the sort that I'll explain. And this particular global workspace is what I'll need to explain some of the properties that I've introduced before in the context of language. So they said it was for consciousness. I'm going to say, no, no, no. Maybe it's for consciousness. I don't know, but at least it's uh, interesting in the context of language. The model that the Han and, and colleagues have developed is actually drawing on, on a, the model first proposed by a philosopher, Bars, that says that um, there is a neuronal workspace that emphasizes the role of distributed neurons with crucially long distance connections, particularly dense in prefrontal, singlet, and uh, parietal regions, that basically give rise to uh, what Bars had called a blackboard image. That is, it's a, it's a it's a workspace that enables you to reach beyond the confines of the modules that um, other animals have and that we certainly have. It basically gives rise to cross-modular computation. And that, I will claim, is precisely what the edge property enables language to do. Because if you remember, the edge property was this property on lexical items of words that essentially remove some of the mm, combinatorial restrictions that are imposed in the various modules where those concepts reside. If you assume that if you can turn these into lexical items, they basically become available as part of this global workspace. Okay? And so if you want to explain the edge property, you'll draw on these long distance connections and ask how these uh, came about. Okay? Um, the Han and others have pointed out that this is reminiscent of the Fodorian um, architecture that um, Jerry Fodor put forth in the modularity of mind, but not in the, n n in the sense that it appears to, in addition to modules, the central executive, and I'll tell you language may have been that, or at least uh, syntax. I'll skip a couple of slides. These talk about the, the, the long distance connections that are necessary for this global workspace. Okay? Um, yes. Um, what's interesting is that the hand has pointed out that once you have this global workspace available in your brain, you can do a certain uh, a few things that are other animals couldn't do. For example, you have modular processors that are now able to exchange information very flexibly. Information can be accumulated across time and across different processors. We can discretize incoming information arising from analog statistical inputs. And we can perform chains of operations and branching. These properties, accidentally or not, match pretty well how Hauser, drawing on a lot of literature, define humaniqueness. Hauser pointed out that we, unlike other animals, have the ability to combine and recombine different types of information and knowledge in order to gain new understanding, apply the same rule or solution to one problem to a different and new situation, create and easily understand symbolic representations of computations and sensory input, and detach mode of thought from raw sensory and perceptual input. These would actually fit pretty well with how the hand would talk about the global Workspace. So I think that there is a nice matching hypothesis there about what we can cognitively do and what we could draw from uh, on the brain side. Okay? But this is not all. This is not, in particular, once you have this global workspace, you'll still need another component of your brain that, would, that will essentially regulate the way this global workspace works. 
And here I will hypothesize, again drawing on uh, a lot of people, especially Francis Crick, who way, way back said that the thalamus could actually be that part of the brain that regulate basically cortical, con um, cortical connections. There is very good evidence from this in the vision uh, literature for the thalamus essentially acting like a clock or regulator of information exchange, but I think that the thalamus has also been uh, implicated in, uh, in functions outside of vision and even in the context of uh, language. The thalamus has been related to working memory, which of course, as everyone knows um, in this room, working memory is a misnomer. It should be called um, attention, okay? Selective attention in particular. It has nothing to do with memory. Um, uh, the role of the thalamus has been occasionally implicated in, in language. Here you have a reference. Here you have a second one, Friedrichi and colleagues, especially Doug Setti, have even shown that the thalamus is sensitive to syntactic and semantic language violations. Interestingly, not phonological um, violations. Okay? So implicating the thalamus as a regulator for the global workspace may not be too crazy, even though it, it is not uh, conventional. Okay, here you have a couple of references for the thalamus acting as a clock. Okay? Um, so far, people might have said, well, this guy has been trying to relate language as the brain, and still he hasn't mentioned Broca yet. So he must have missed something in Linguistics 101. Um, and the answer is, no, I haven't, well, yeah, I missed a lot of things in Linguistics 101, but uh, not this one. Um, in particular, I think that Broca's region uh, has a role to play, but not the central role that many people often ascribe to it in the context of language. I don't think that it's specific, uh, specifically devoted to language, but it has a role to play in particular as part of a th circuit that Michael Ullman and, and others have uh, called the basal ganglia thalamocortical circuit. Note that the, th the thalamus comes up again. Um, <coughs> More precisely, I think that the Broca's area is crucially implicated in turning whatever computation of this global workspace regulated by the thalamus does to basically what is eventually becomes externalized um, in terms of speech or sign. And um, you know, people like Peter Hag Hagord have said that Broca could actually be a convergence zone precisely to do this kind of externalization process. Here's a slide uh, drawing from um, Greg Hickok's work on Broca, showing that actually Broca should be decomposed in terms of the kind of computation it does. And what I find interesting, although I don't have too much time uh, to tell you the details uh, today, what I find interesting is that the decomposition that Hickok um, you know, puts forth in the context of Broca um, matches precisely the sort of decomposition that linguists of a generative persuasion need to assume in order to understand the mapping from syntax to phonology. Uh, what's becoming very clear to many linguists is that morphology is actually not only a very messy component but also a decomposable component. There is one side of morphology that directly relates to syntax that's called morphosyntax. There is another one that's called morphophonology. And these two sides of morphology, I think, corresponds, if you go into the details, to how Hickok and others are decomposing Broca and the kind of computation that it does, some that are more local, more finite state uh, than, than others. Um, the more finite state ones would be more directly related uh, to phonology. Okay. All right. Um, what I've given you basically is a is, is sort of a, an anatomy of the language faculty, a rough anatomy of it in the brain. Physiologically, in order to make it work, we could draw from existing work, especially the work of Bushaki and others, that have actually uh, come up with a model for what they call neural syntax. Don't be misled by the word <laughs> syntax, but the way um, the way this works is that Bushaki have identified three components of how the brain works that match precisely the three properties of 
of natural language syntax that I've given you, namely cell assemblies, synapse symbols, and readers that sort of match my edge property set merge and then uh, cyclic transfer. So physiologically, we can actually draw an existing word uh, to make it work. Okay. The, the, the question that, of course, um, people in this audience are asking is that, uh, is this kind of architecture that I've sketched evolvable? And I'll give you a couple of hypotheses that I think are currently available and sort of make this story interesting. It's no surprise uh, if I start with telling you that uh, the sort of brain we have is particularly uh, large and complex. Um, lots of hypotheses about what exactly this means by um, large and complex, okay? But what I think is far more important for uh, the sort of story that I want to tell you is not so much the size of the brain, but actually the shape of the brain. That is, mm, size will be a critical component for me to get from mind to brain and to evolution, but far more interesting will be the fact that the, the human brain, the sapiens brain, has a particular shape that, is act that makes it even more specific than its size. As you know, for uh, at least given the information that we have, Neanderthals and others really also had a, a rather big brain, perhaps even bigger than us. But the shape of ours is particularly distinct in a way that will directly relate to some of the things I have given you. So here is a, a recent a synthesis paper published in Evolutionary Biology by two people from the Max Planck Institute that, um, you know, I'll give you just a slide that shows that more than size, shape really matters uh, for us and should, of course, have played a role in evolution. Their synthesis actually starts with a hypothesis coming from Spain in 2003 by Brunner and colleague, where they have shown that the sapiens brain is much more globular than um, you know, other brains that we know can reconstruct. And they have based their hypotheses on uh, you know, trying to reconstruct brain shape from, uh, from, from skulls that we have as, as fossils. Um, <coughs> I'll give you just one slide out of many I've given you that will make the uh, thing clear. If you look on the left, we have the sapiens brain based on, on skull reconstructions, and then we have the archaic brain model in our lineage, and the main difference, the one that I want you to focus on, is on the fact that the sapiens brain looks much more like, um, is spheroid, it looks more like a ball than the archaic domain. Um, the archaic sort of model is much more elongated, ours is more, more globular. And that seems to uh, be particularly uh, salient in much of the literature reviewing this, and this is something that I'll, I'll just recruit. If you look at the uh, development of how the brain works, and you compare this with how the brain develops in our colossus relatives, there is a stage very early uh, in development postnatally in the context of human brain evolutions where there is basically, as you can see, two curves. The, the one on the left is for us and uh, the one on the right is basically giving rise to the archaic brain development model. And this sharp rise at the beginning gives rise to the globular kind of shape that um, gives our distinctness. This is comparing it with uh, chimpanzees. Uh, this comparison, again, the same kind of sharp divine, sharp rise for um, modern humans. And on the right, on, on, in red, you have Neanderthals. And basically, you have size-wise something that basically reached the same level, if you want, but shape-wise mm, does it, uh, it be, is very distinct. That is, you reach sort of the same target in mm, global uh, brain size but through different roads. And these different roads, I think, make a difference. So development uh, makes a difference for, uh, for evolution. Okay? Um, so this is another reference uh, showing this. Uh, I should say that um, this kind of new development is not quite neoteny. It seems to have been like a particularly new um, stage of development that's not found in other species, and this was the sharp rise on the graph uh, that I've shown you. Now, why should um, a more globular, a spheroid brain matter for what I've given you? 
when I think it matters if you take into account the fact that I've told you what regulates this global workspace is the thalamus. And if you look at where the thalamus lies, it's right in here. It's right in the middle, basically. It's the subcortical part that seems to be placed in a particularly advantageous um, location in the context of a spheroid uh, kind of brain. Okay, so here is this thalamus in green, and if you see this, I'm sure that you're thinking of something like this. And it's known uh, that you know this red point is uh, makes all the other points in the circumference equidistant, so equally accessible. And I think that this equally accessible is what the thalamus enables us to think cross-modularly. That is, it makes all the modules equally accessible. So here is the thalamus, and um, if you study the connection of a thalamus in a spheroid brain, they are much, they work much better than uh, in the archaic elongated mode of um, brain size that other species have. A more globalized brain, in fact, minimizes distance between neurons and therefore reduces wiring length. This is a hypothesis that goes back to people like McCarthy, although they haven't been exploited in the context of language. And so it would increase cognitive e efficiency and the sort of conceptual traffic that we engage in. Last point uh, before conclusions. Um, would this be an adaptation, this globular kind of uh, brain? We will probably never know. I'm sorry to tell you, but in order for us to reach the skull size, um, there are so many different things, so many different factors that could have actually um, enabled us to get there. Um, Daniel Lieberman and, um, and, and, and many other colleagues of his have pointed out that various um, factors in our lineage could have eventually led to this uh, globular kind of brain that we have, and we'll probably never know which factor was the crucial one. So I think that this question is basically too hard. There are many um, conclusions that one can draw from it, but rather than taking uh, more time, I'll stop here and uh, let you ask questions. Thank you. Okay, we have about 15 minutes for questions. Please raise your hands and identify yourself before asking the question. Um, I'm Alain from the CNRS in France. Um, thank you very much for this very impressive uh, uh, integrative uh, synthesis review. Um, I just have a very simple question. Would you um, exchange concerning your three principles, general principles, the words H by chunk, the word merge by association, and the word cited by phonological loop. Um, I didn't get the first one. I got the, the first one is changing age by check. Chunk. Which is a psychological concept. Uh -huh. uh, and so edge by chunk, second one merge versus association, third one phonological loop for cyclic transfer. Right. Yeah. Um, almost, but no. No, and I'll tell you why. I, I'm happy with um, the second one, the merge association. Yeah, I don't think this is such a big deal. I, I know a lot of people think of merge as this magic bullet. I'm, I'm not putting my money on that one. Um, the reason I, I, don't, I wouldn't like to make the substitutions that you suggest for the third one, the phonological loop, I think would only be part of what I've called cyclic transfer. Because the sort of... Um, um, cyclic exchange of information from syntax to the to the other cognitive systems that interact with it it's not just for phonology it's also for meaning right that is we relate to like the modules that where you know those concepts reside and uh, so the phonological loop would be only one part but the part dealing with externalization so it would be too it wouldn't be enough Okay, though it would it would be fine. Um, when it comes to edge and chunk, I wouldn't like to make 
this substitution either. I think that chunking actually as an operation corresponds pretty much with what theoretical linguists uh, call cyclic transfer. Okay, so to the third one, okay, as a process. And the edge property, I think, is it's the one that's been emphasized the least in the theoretical literature, but I think it's the crucial one. It's basically, like I said, it's, it's a simple, well, I don't know simple or not, but it's an operation that essentially said you can now combine what before looked like conceptual apples and oranges. Okay? Liz Spelke has said that uh, we, we as sapiens have become particularly smart, if you want, because we have become particularly flexible, conceptually speaking. It turns out that we have a system that enables us to combine things that were in the minds of other species but isolated from one another. And I think that what I've called the edge property or you know, the thing that defines lexical items is precisely that. If you look at the literature, the one that I was alluding to on the rich conceptual substrate that we can draw from, one thing that's very clear from that literature is that the concepts that animals have are very, have very, very strict um, combinatorial restrictions. Okay, this is why they are so modular. That is, animals find it very hard to use a concept that they have from one domain and apply it to another domain. Okay? They are not generalists, they are experts, basically. We are experts too, uh, but I think through language we sort of got a system that enabled us to become generalists, okay, to give rise to this flexibility. And so I don't think chunking would give you that. Okay? Now the edge property may not be the best word for it, but whatever it does, it should be an operation that essentially, uh, well, it relies on those long distance connections to create cross modular, uh, essentially, information transfer. Okay? So I don't think, but behind your question, I think there is the model, uh, there are certain models of working memory, central executive, and these things. Yeah, you're shaking your head. Yeah, in part, it's not. It's not too different from it. Uh, there are differences, but the sort of uh, hypothesis I've sketched um, would actually be, uh, fall within the same family, if you want, if you are generous with the, how the family is defined. Other question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, and I see two over here, and on the back, so let's start here. Let's uh, try to keep the questions and the answers fairly brief so that we can try to get in. I think 20 minutes should be enough uh, for this one. For the so answer? I, well, for the question and the answer combined. <laughs> so I, I'm struggling to try and synthesize the views of the two violinists, you and Pietelli Palmarini. Why would you do that? I have, because <laughs> you are both in some sense offering a starting point based on the same concepts of linguistics. And then I saw two things in common I'd like to comment on. First, the emphasis on the globular. The globular eye of the jellyfish was the key for Piatelli Palmarini. Uh, the globular shape of the brain was the key for you. The other thing I see in common is that there's absolutely no discussion of communication unless it is to dismiss it as relevant, it, as Massimo did, or to ignore it as you did. And uh, I'd like to know how uh, you think, or, or whether you think not, um, the ability to communicate more effectively could play into an evolutionary story, or is it just some chance of acceptation at the end of the whole thing? Yeah, that, 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 that's a question? I think it's a question. Okay, okay. Yeah. No, I thought there was something uh, more coming up. No, uh, well, the global thing, uh, we I haven't met before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the com and the communication part is interesting. Um, uh, it's, it's not quite ignored in this talk, although it's not mentioned just because I only have a finite amount of time. I think it does play a role, but not as centrally as other people think. That is, there was one slide where I said that in order for me to get from uh, this uh, minimal specifications that I started off to um, like full-fledged languages of the sort we know it today will have to rely 
on uh, essentially cultural evolution of the sort that uh, many people have, have uh, investigated. And so I think that the biology did not relate to communication. It was only when uh, a modern brain was around that suddenly these things were used for communicative and social purposes. Uh, uh, roughly, yes. Uh, roughly, yes. Okay, so it's not like it doesn't play any role, but it didn't play a role in the origin, but it certainly played a role in its subsequent <laughs> evolution. Okay? I suspect we disagree. Okay, um, I suspect we disagree. Kind of mm -hmm. uh, Russell Gray, you're the uh, How does a more spherical brain? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. How does your more spherical brain explain edge, nudge, and uh, social transfer? It, it doesn't explain the three. What it does is um, having a more... So it's far more indirect than this. Uh, so this is why I don't like terms like FLN or highly specific properties, you know, uh, so specific to language. What I think the globular brain did is essentially locate the thalamus in a particularly advantageous position to regulate a global workspace that, strictly speaking, our closest relatives or Neanderthals could have ha actually had. It just wasn't as efficient for them. Now, this efficiency is precisely, I think, at uh, the heart of what I've called the edge property, namely the ability to make use of those long distance connections in an efficient way to relate, to essentially engage in cross-modular uh, information transfer, conceptual transfer. And because the thalamus is um, the regulator of the global workspace, um, having a more globular brain essentially enables that kind of regulation to be more efficient. That's the idea. So it doesn't give you the suite of the three properties, okay? But it essentially enables these three properties to work pretty well in tandem and give us the cognitive flexibility that Spelke and others have identified in the realm of psychology. That would be the idea. Just for a follow-up, can you calculate the, the difference in efficiency? Um, I personally haven't, but others have. Okay. And this is a hypothesis uh, that, uh, like I said, goes back to, I think, the late 80s by McCarthy and others, showing that, um, you know, depending on the, the position of the thalamus, you may actually have that. Now, what hasn't been done, what's kind of homework for me after, uh, you know, afterwards, is um, linking the global workspace of the Dehan and all, at all group to, to the results of the thalamus that other people have already reached. That's the homework, okay? So that's the hypothesis, that's where it might fail. So if it turns out, indeed, that the two hypotheses don't combine as well as I think they ought to, then, you know, uh, what I've said would be incorrect. I guess I'm just rather skeptical that there's a small difference in uh, efficiency is going to produce all the action. Okay, there are several other people with their hands up that they could pass the mic around. I think there's, I see two, two people at least in this area, so. <laughs>
uh, more uh, um, heterogeneous. And point two, what is so Cartesian about this model? I mean, there's no mindful duality, isn't it? I mean, uh, it's mainly an outcome of biology. So there's no mind as a separate entity. Uh, I, I'd rather call it more materialistic than that. So please, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks for uh, the the first question. You're right. This is something that uh, this is where assumptions come in, and I uh, forget to make them explicit. This is correct. Um, when I talked about the edge property and the difference between concepts and lexical items, I was assuming that the lexical pool that we draw from to combine is indeed not specific to specific languages. Okay, that is it's universal in a way that's not like French versus English or something. French versus English versus Navajo and so on, come, uh, the lexical differences there comes crucially after the process of um, cultural uh, evolution. This is where, you know, the, so in order to get from my kind of lexicon, the pool of lexical resources that I have, to specific language lexica, then you really need processes like grammaticalization and other things that really then introduces differences and variations. Uh, so that's correct. Are you thinking correct. of a like Nietzschean set of universal concepts then? Um, Leibniz like the Well, I, I don't know what Leibniz was thinking, okay. honestly. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they would be universal. For the second question, um, yeah, if it's not Cartesian, that's okay, I think. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I briefly toyed with the idea of calling this the, the mind's body plan, but then I thought people would say mind and body together on the same slide, but that's okay. Okay, I'm sorry to say I think we have to stop here. Um, is that true? Yeah, this is the end of the uh, first plenary session, so if you have further questions, um, there's still a few days of the conference, so please try to uh, call on a during one of the breaks. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.